name is Abdul Hamid Zuhiri. Uh, I'm originally a professor at the School of Medicine at Cairo University, and uh, I'm not, I now work at the uh, Ministry of Scientific Research as the coordinator of international cooperation and the executive director of the Research, Development, and Innovation Program. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, welcome our esteemed uh, panelists today. So, from this side, we have uh, Professor Sharif Fakhri. He is the executive director of the Science and Technology Development Fund. And then we have Dr. George Papajorji, who is the minister counselor responsible uh, of science, technology, and innovation at the EU delegation in Egypt. And then we have Dr. Michael Harms, who is the director of the DAD, or the German Exchange, Academic Exchange Service in Egypt. Welcome all. I'd also like to welcome uh, all of you at the audience. And we are going to uh, start this session with very brief uh, talks from me and George, and uh, really very brief just to acquaint you with the uh, cooperation between EU and Egypt. And then we are going to uh, start uh, then uh, our discussion with the panelists. First, I would uh, take a couple of rounds of questions. I will pose a couple of uh, questions to each of them. And then we will uh, open the floor for uh, questions, comments, and discussions. Uh, I'd like also to say that uh, we have on the panel uh, Professor Magad Shirbini, the uh, President of the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology and the Assistant Minister for Scientific Research, but he is a bit delayed in traffic and he's on his way, he should be here uh, in the next 15 minutes. So, <coughs> EU-Egypt cooperation. I think Egypt has a long-standing cooperation with the EU, let alone course, long-standing history uh, of cultural cooperation. But when it comes to scientific cooperation, the milestone here is the science and technology uh, agreement that was signed in 2005. And through this agreement, we are now more actively uh, cooperating with the EU. And I would leave uh, 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 George Papa Georgiou to describe to you the, the framework through which we are cooperating with the EU. But when we say the EU, we here mean the European Union as, as a union. But of course, we have also long-standing cooperation with several EU member states, and among which I, I would like to highlight our cooperation with Germany. Actually, we, co we started cooperation uh, uh, with Germany long ago. Uh, I think the day they are are celebrating their 50th anniversary in, in Egypt. It's uh, two years ago. Two years ago. They celebrated their 50th anniversary in Egypt. And I'm also glad to say that Egypt was one of the first countries that the uh, they opens uh, an office in. And uh, we started in 2007 our decade of science and technology, whereby we have each year uh, uh, a year of cooperation with a different, uh, with an international, uh, uh, with a different country. And we started by Germany in 2007, then we moved to Japan in 2008, then Italy, 9, France 2010, the US in 2011, and currently we are in the year of science and cooperation, of science and innovation cooperation with the EU as a whole. And this will allow us to cooperate with several member states that we, we couldn't have years of science with. So we had years of science with three member states, Germany, Italy and France, but other member states and the smaller member states uh, that normally do not cooperate uh, with Egypt, uh, this is the chance to cooperate with them. So this decade of science, the, 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 the aim of this decade of science is to link the scientists on both sides, from Egypt and from the other countries where, which we cooperate with, and build bridges between the scientists and then they will know how to cooperate. We don't we don't think that the ministry or the research authorities on both sides could do more than just provide the platform and build the bridge between the scientists because the scientists themselves, they know how to take this further without our help. And this is exactly what we're trying to do. And the objective of our session today is to highlight this year of science, of cooperation with the EU, listen to your ideas, 
about how we could better implement this here and also uh, uh, highlight some success stories in cooperating with the EU because I think cooperation with the EU uh, has a lot of success stories that need to be highlighted because the, the, the value of this is to first motivate people because some of you I'm sure don't know about how extensive we cooperate in science and technology with the EU. Just to give you an, an, uh, a small example, in 2007 when, when FP7, the framework program number seven started by the European Commission, when we had very limited uh, involvement in this program where we started by FP5 already, but in FP6, which ended in 2006, we had limited cooperation. <laughs> I can tell you that from the years of 2007 until 2010, we managed to triple the amount of projects that we had and quadruple the amount of fund. So there is some positive uh, uh, notes in, in, in our cooperation. They need to be highlighted. Also with Germany and other member states, you need to know what's happening and we'd like to listen to your comments and suggestions in this regard. So without any uh, uh, further delay, I will now give the microphone to George Papa George, who's going to take you very quickly through the framework of cooperating with the EU, and then we'll start our panel discussion or our roundtable. Thank you. George, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. So my name is uh, George Papa Georgiou, and uh, I am the head of the Science and Technology Office in the European Union delegation to Egypt. So um, I will not, Hamid gave uh, uh, the, 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 the overall frame, framework of our cooperation. I will not go, I will not add too much on it, but I will tell you a few things which may be of interest for our discussion this, uh, this afternoon. So, um, the, the European Union is, uh, has a big program, the Framework Program, where we found collaborative projects at the European level. The particularity of this program, which is a huge one, 52 billion euros for seven years, so around 8 to 10 billion euros per year. The particularity of this program is that all the projects are open to non-European par partners, to non-European participation. So if a European project, if the participants of this project want to invite a non-European partner, a lab from the United States, from uh, Brazil, or from China, Japan or Egypt, they are allowed to do so, and the non-European partner receives funding from Europe. So, with the agreement we signed between the European Union and Egypt in 2005, the main outcome, there are three main outcomes. The first one is that we, the European Union opened an office in the European delegation in Cairo, and this is important. The second one is that because we have an agreement, we have a regular contact to discuss our policies uh, and how to cooperate in the future. And the third and the most important outcome of this agreement is that Egypt is now participating in a very high number of European projects, in 95 projects of the Seven Framework Program. This is... Uh, now, what, what are these projects? Many of these projects are small support or coordinating actions, but you can also find big research projects or even demonstration projects. For instance, we started last year a demonstration project of 22 million euros to build a, to build a, a demonstration site in, uh, in Egypt for the desalinization of water from renewable energy. 
So you have Italian partners and also French, German partners, and four Egyptian partners in this big demonstration project. This is just an example. Now, uh, we will have our discussion later on. You will see that although the participation of Egypt in the framework program is important, but this is the starting point to do more and more focused cooperation we, between Europe and Egypt and the other Mediterranean countries. I will stop here, so, and we, ha we will have the opportunity to come back to all this. Thank you. Thank you, George. So, as, as you heard from, from uh, Dr. George, Papa George, that Egypt is now enjoying the, the, the first place in the Mediterranean in terms of projects that we had from FP7. But I would like to maybe uh, pose here a provocative uh, remark to you, but Egypt with a population of 85 plus million people should have definitely much more than Tunisia, let's say, with 11 million. If we compare, if we do these projects per capita or per researcher, which is more, to be more specific, we will not, unfortunately, be the first. So there is way, there is m much more potential for what we could do cooperating with the EU. And this is why we're having this uh, year of science to try to maximize the benefit from our cooperation with the EU. I will uh, start by <coughs> posing a question. Actually, I wanted to pose a question. I wanted to start by Professor Magda Cherbini, but since he's not in the room yet, I will then pose this question to George. And then maybe uh, when Professor Cherbini is here, we'll, uh, we'll pose it to him. What does the EU expect out of cooperating with Egypt along this year? So definitely for this year to be successful, there has to be mutual benefit from both sides. What does the EU expect to cooperate, to, to benefit from this cooperation with Egypt? I would also be prov provocative. I don't think the EU expects the EU, but mostly the member states of the EU expect. Because this is the year of science and innovation, by the way. It's not only year of science, year of science and innovation between the European Europe and Egypt. But Europe is the European Union, but more than the European Union, you have big member states or smaller member states who are very interested in cooperation with Egypt and the other Mediterranean countries. So with this year, what we expect is to make more visible the cooperation between each member state and Egypt. Uh, small countries like Greece, my country, or Belgium, they have already cooperation in several areas with Egypt, although at a relatively low scale. By putting this cooperation within the, the European frame, we make this cooperation more visible and we give more opportunities to, to, to make it known, so to have a stronger participation, and why not a participation not only of these countries, but also of other countries from Europe. So we extend somehow the perspective of the, of the cooperation at the European level. And this, this I see as the main benefit from the year of science. Of course, what is also very important for Europe is to, to better know what Egypt is able to do at the research and innovation level. So I do hope that with creating all these meetings, gatherings, links between European researchers and Egyptian researchers, we will better know what are the capacities of the Egyptian researchers 
so we, we will have a, a more solid base for future cooperation. Definitely one of the objectives of, of, of this year is to make visible the research potential of Egypt in the EU. This is from our side. We'd like to, to highlight the potential that Egyptian researchers have in cooperating with the EU so that the EU researchers would come to uh, acknowledge and realize that Egypt has a potential and then they seek cooperating with Egyptian <coughs> researchers. But one of the important objectives also of this, of this year is to form this regional platform. The, 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 let's say the attitude now for cooperation is towards cooperating with the EU as bi-regional bi -regional cooperation. And our region, when I say a region here, I refer to the Mediterranean, the southern Mediterranean region. And I think also all these changes in the southern Mediterranean regions are, are probably uh, uh, bringing back our identity to the Mediterranean. So we are an Arab country, yes, but we are also an Arab Mediterranean country. Because this is, this is, these are where the changes are happening now. And this is, we have to understand our identity and we have to, to come closer to our identity. And the EU also cooperates with us as one of the southern Mediterranean countries. And I think Egypt, with its critical mass, uh, and here uh, uh, I'd like to, to, to remind you that uh, every third Mediterranean is an Egyptian, meaning that Egypt has one third of the population of the southern Mediterranean. So with the critical mass that Egypt has, cooperating with Egypt, having a year of science and technology cooperation with Egypt would definitely also help the regional cooperation between the EU and the Mediterranean region. And I think this is sure. one uh, uh, potential that we should should be explored to the fullest during this year. So I would like to, I'm sorry. Okay. I would like to now move to uh, uh, ask Dr. Shiri Fakhri. The SEDF has several bilateral agreements with several EU member states. So how, how do you think we could use this year of science in the, in, the, in the frame of this year of science, how could the SDF contribute to the EU-Egypt cooperation? Well, the EU-Egypt uh, cooperation is uh, already existing actually before this year of science because of the bilateral uh, cooperation programs in uh, research uh, funding and uh, movement of uh, scientists between Europe and uh, Egypt because we have uh, several uh, cooperation programs like the German uh, program, like the uh, French, uh, and uh, we are trying to uh, benefit from uh, these uh, programs because uh, they give uh, opportunities of uh, exchanging knowledge, of course, between the researchers and providing facilities in, the, in both countries, actually, because or in both uh, regions, because in uh, Europe there are some facilities uh, which are not, in some cases, uh, available in Egypt, but at the same time, uh, the reverse applies because, uh, for example, if we are talking about uh, solar uh, energy research and so on, uh, the best way, uh, area to, to, to work on this is actually in uh, Egypt is one of the best places to, to do this work. Uh, in addition, uh, having the uh, young people uh, go uh, to Europe and, uh, yeah, any, acknowledge the uh, science culture back there and how uh, science is dealt with and how science is used to uh, for the benefit of the uh, society. Uh, all, all these are uh, parts of the activities which are uh, done or funded by STDF. Uh, of course, the, the, there is one uh, area which we would like that uh, during this year 
we develop something to uh, to increase further co the cooperation, especially in the area which was already mentioned, which is the demonstration uh, projects, taking the research results and uh, putting them into the uh, benefit of the society yeah, to make uh, demonst big demonstration projects for the scientific uh, new ideas. So this is one of the things which needs to be also added to the cooperation. Uh, I think I'll, I'll stop here. In terms of, of bilateral funds with EU member states, you have uh, Germany, France, and Italy, I think? Italy is on its way. On its way. Yes. Okay. So, I think this also shows that the three years we had with the uh, years of science and technology with, with the three member states of Europe that we had before Germany, Italy, and France are uh, paying off. So I'd like to welcome Professor Magda Cerbini. And uh, we were, uh, just to update you, we were in our first question discussing the uh, year of uh, science and technology. So I asked uh, uh, George representing the EU what was his, uh, what is the benefit from on the EU side. And uh, then uh, I would like to ask you to, what are the, or do you need maybe a couple of minutes to, uh, <laughs> it's uh, heavy traffic, so... <laughs> what, 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 do you think, what do you think are the, 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 the... What are the expectations of the Ministry of Scientific Research from uh, such a year of cooperation with the EU? Uh, I'm sure you have already highlighted that, uh, that during the, the policy of uh, science decade, uh, 10 years of cooperation with different countries, I think we benefited a lot and this has been very clearly demonstrated through the year of science with Germany in 2007 and with Italy and France and Japan. And uh, the benefit that came on Egypt on this, highlighted by a big project in uh, concerning solar power with Italy, uh, the Japanese Egyptian University of uh, Egypt, uh, the Italian University, the program that we are doing with Germany. There is a lot of benefit that came to Egypt on this. And I believe that having a program with the EU countries and uh, given that we are going into the new era of horizon 2020 that is coming soon worth of 80 billion euro out of the European Commission <coughs> is, a, is a great opportunity for um, developing much more stronger relationship between Egypt and <coughs> the European countries there is initiative that uh, I'm sure that you will be talking about uh, in the for the Mediterranean there is an uh, initiative that is going for the ETCTP, which is the platform for the clinical trials. There, so there is a lot of opportunities, I believe, that's going to be there. And Egypt can benefit from all this. And having the chance to collaborate with uh, many European countries like that will definitely provide opportunity for our scientists to exchange. Um, I'm sure you discussed uh, what the benefit for <laughs> Europe on this, because the Mediterranean by itself is just uh, like a small lake between the two borders and uh, scientists can move easily and, uh, and can uh, exchange their expertise and their knowledge and uh, Egypt will definitely benefit and Europe will definitely benefit from something like that. So I, I hope that this year with this event, with this activity, uh, we'll be able to develop such relationship and much, make it much more stronger. Thank you. And I'd like to highlight here that uh, during the year of cooperation with Germany, the uh, they, are, they played a very important role. And I don't think that we could have achieved as much as we had during this year, which remains, uh, uh, I would say, the most successful year of cooperation we had if the DAD was not uh, placed here in, in Egypt and playing this uh, uh, role of facilitation. Uh, Definitely, we, we gained a lot, and I think we, we, our, our cooperation with Germany took uh, a different, uh, uh, a better road since this year. But, and we're continuing, actually, and I think uh, uh, Dr. Harms would like to maybe highlight, I will give him a chance later on to highlight what he, they are having uh, uh, in the pipelines. But I would like to ask him now, what do you think could be the role of Germany as First, as, of course, the biggest economy in, in, in the EU, and second, as a big country that already has uh, uh, strong scientific relations with Egypt, what could be the role of Germany during this year of cooperation with the 27 member states? 
Yeah, first of all, thank you for the kind and nice words. Um, obviously, this is, uh, uh, one does like to hear nice words, but I would like to stress that it's always, you know, two sides. And partnership always means that the two sides need to have, uh, you know, benefit each from that. And I think I can say that um, Egypt uh, has proven to be a very, very reliable and staunch partner, even um, in a time when the country is going through a difficult period, um, it has proven to be a very, very reliable uh, partner and friend, and uh, I would like to mention that uh, at this stage. Um, actually, also, thank you for inviting me here. I just realized, being based in Cairo, that I come to Alexandria much uh, too few times. Um, it is uh, uh, a place that uh, really one should travel more often. What do we have from the year of uh, the EU, um, Egyptian year of science? Well, first of all, um, again, it is a very good opportunity to uh, pinpoint to the fact, to the community in Germany, that uh, there is um, a lot of readiness on the part of uh, Egyptian partners to collaborate with Europe and indeed also with German institutions. Um, my fellow country uh, people, especially when they are in research, they tend to look to the United States, they tend to look to India, to uh, possibly other European countries, but of course you have quite a number of disciplines where it's uh, very, very much worthwhile to collaborate with Egypt. Uh, I'm thinking of the medical field, for instance, you know, uh, research in hepatitis C, for instance, or cancer research. Um, I'm thinking about urban planning, Certainly, if you want to work in urban planning, um, Egypt is a very good place to go and do research with uh, partners uh, here. Uh, re renewable energies, obviously, uh, if you go uh, and travel down the, um, the, uh, the Red Sea, you would uh, easily come to Safarana, where there's a big uh, wind park which has been established with a German partners. So there's a lot of potential here, and uh, again, we have found that um, with our friends and partners in Egypt, we have uh, a very reliable side. And this is, I think, what uh, attracts um, German universities and uh, research institutions. And I would just hope that uh, our already uh, good channels you know, will deepen. Um, you have uh, highlighted already, Abdelhamid, that um, we are expanding quite uh, notably our cooperation. We have been equipped with additional funding, but this uh, I will elaborate on at the later stage. Thank you, Michel. Can I, can I add? Uh, please. please. Uh, this is the year of science and innovation. So in innovation, the, the, the question of Hamid is what are the benefits? I think in the innovation, you don't have a linear, it's not a linear process in the innovation. You don't, you know where, when you start and from where you start, you don't know where you will end. So <coughs> this year of science, we may speak about the benefits now, the expected benefits, but I believe that the benefits will be much more than what we see now because all these links we create, all these uh, exchanges, the, the, the policy makers from each side, from north, uh, the south, who meet, and uh, all these put together will certainly create a new dynamic that we don't see yet, and I strongly believe Yes, this is a very important remark, actually, and uh, we have to understand also that Europe has uh, definitely an interest in, in, in Egypt and the Mediterranean because we are currently exporting a lot of goods to Europe, a lot of food products, and in the future there is a strong belief that uh, this part of the world will be exporting energy to the EU. So working in innovation and building the innovation system and building the... the, 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 the Compatible industry actually is also a very important uh, objective that I think the EU should have. Uh, may I ask all of you please to turn off or put on silent your mobile phones, please? Now we have just, we're warming up to understand 
what are the expectations of both sides from this year. But to really have an effective year of cooperation with the EU, we also have to maybe get into uh, uh, more details of how, of, of like, of how both systems are compatible to work together. And definitely, uh, when we talk about uh, this uh, year of science and innovation with the EU, we have to understand that Egypt is passing in the region, not only Egypt, is passing through difficult times. With the start of the Egyptian revolution, we were all inspired, and, and I'm sure I speak for, for a lot of people, that we also had this very uh, 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 immediate uh, belief and aspiration that Egypt's science is going to be revolutionized. And uh, this is shown by the cover of the Science magazine on, uh, in July of 2011 with the, revolution, with the uh, uh, title of Revolutionizing Egypt's Science. This was July of last year. However, I'm sure we all also share the concern that things did not quite pass as, the, as we have expected. The unfolding of events was not uh, very much encouraging. And if we look at this publication, which is the site, it's a German publication mentioning, this is in 16th of April, it's the online site, and it said, it says bitterness, disappointment, and anger in Egyptian universities. Definitely, to say the least, we don't have the same expectations as we had in July of 2011 to April of 2012. So nine months down the road, our mindset is changing, our expectations are being much more moderated and downgraded, and we're not feeling the same. We have to understand this, what we're passing through, this appointment in our uh, uh, Egyptian universities and on the street, that we're not attaining what we have aspired to attain, to also be able to uh, uh, use this in planning our cooperation with the EU. I have one concern actually here. If, if there is a lot of disappointment and unrest and maybe uh, some pessimism about the future, how would this affect our cooperation with the EU in terms of brain drain? We all know that our researchers, and much more maybe now, would like to get an opportunity to work in, in, an, in a more advanced country like the EU, where they have better equipment and better lab facilities, let aside better standards of living. So I would like to pose this question to Professor Shirbini. What do you think is the effect of this vagueness on the uh, Egyptian researchers and research institutes? Well, this is the... This is a tough question, actually. It's, um, so many things are involved here. So maybe a little bit. I'm gonna. My answer is gonna be a little bit lengthy. Um, after the revolution happened, um, everybody has very high expectation that we will be able to achieve so many of the things that we were hoping to get. And actually, you put a, a very ambitious plan to get more funding from the government and to be able to spend it on things which I'm going to talk about right now. And the government was planning to get um, donations and borrowing a lot of money from different places. Then there was a decision not to borrow from different places, and we have to stick to the amount of money we are able to generate. And of course, as you know, that the Egyptian economy used to um, do 5%, 7% at the, at the certain period of time. Uh, but now I don't think that this year we will be able to go up to 1% or even less. Of course, this is, uh, we are surviving on, on uh, I would say, on the, on the fumes of uh, what we should be surviving on. We suffered from uh, so much in tourism, we suffer so much in the income we are having, but actually a lot of economic, economic people are saying that we are doing well compared to others, 
even though in the situation we are having right now, and once the political situation is settled and all the institutions are required are in place, we will be able to move ahead forward in full force. And this is what we hope will happen. But anyway, this affected us in a way that uh, not so much funding that we were expecting to get is there. So we had to use the amount of money which is there. And I will try to answer now the part of the question, how did we deal with it in terms of brain drain? Because one of the most important thing is that after the revolution, everybody, even outside Egypt, wanted to come back and see an opportunity. How can he help? And the people here, their expectation became very high that you want to do something, but you don't know how. So um, the most important thing is that the environment for science and technology that we are working in is the attractive thing or the propelling thing. It could be repulsion to anybody to go away, or it could be attractive to anybody to come back. So we had a different mechanism for doing this. We tried to allocate and identify the areas where we have good competitiveness, where we are doing well, and where we can, if we add some more money into that, they will be able to attract more scientists in. And this actually happened when we developed the program for nanotechnology, for instance. When we developed that, we said we are going to collaborate with one of the major companies in this, was in the US, which is IBM. And then we said we are going to work with Egyptian scholars who are outside Egypt or in Egypt. And we announced a call all over the world for all the Egyptians who are working in different places. We did not believe that we will get such a good attention. We received 270 applications from different scientists from Egypt and from outside Egypt. All are Egyptian. And we selected from them only 10. And these 10 were sent to the proper places where they received their training. And we started building the facility for them. Of course, there is delays in building this facility now because of the economic problem. But let me tell you, these scientists succeeded in producing more than 18 different international patents and 28 international publications and even intellectual property rights that is ready to be sold or even used by the industry. So once we can make the environment a better environment, things can move very well. We are now discussing with our partners and our collaborators who are giving and helping us in the mobility grants that we don't only give the money for the people to travel, but they should have a component of what's called reintegration so they can get a part of the funding to be able to come back to the country and to build their facility where they will be able starting their own garden and attracting more students to their work. So we need to have different mechanisms to be able to do so. How the revolution will affect our brain drain, how we will be seeing in the future people leaving the country, I think if we make the process as less painful as possible and we can make it as short as possible, we will be able to retain our resources. If it will drag longer, if we face more obstacles, of course there will be a risk that this will happen. But I can see from, from speaking and negotiating with our colleagues in the north that everybody is willing to help. Everybody, and I'm sure here George and Michael can speak about that more than me, that the opportunities that they are providing, they are helping our transformation to be a smooth one, and they are helping us to retain our critical mass, which is very important for us. Uh, we have about 100,000 scientists now, and we would like to increase it to 130,000 over the next three years. So there's going to be a lot of investment being in place. So I hope that our plans will be met with sizable fund. Uh, we have promises, several promises, uh, starting from the fiscal year of July this year. And I hope if we receive that, we will be able to achieve this. I would finalize my comment that by um, we just recently launched a program called Equip Me, and it is for all the researchers in the research institutes to provide support for directly for the researchers. And at the same time, we provided another initiative worth of 110 million Egyptian pound to be spent this year for upgrading the research facilities. These are very important steps. If we don't improve the environment we are working on, we will be facing a lot of brain drain. So I think it's a, it's a, it's a very good step. It's an initial step, and we need more 
of the funding to be able to do that and to transform our facilities into a better equipped so then we can have much more scientists working. Thank you. I think Dr. Magid has here highlighted a very important aspect, which is we have to have a mechanism of integrating our researchers once they come back from missions and fellowships and travels abroad, because this is where we really lose the majority of our uh, research capacity. We are working on this, and I think in also designing this cooperation with the EU, we have to put this in mind that I'm sure the EU, of course, they, they are trying from their side to limit immigration, but I'm sure that uh, this, this is selective limiting of immigration because when they get a highly qualified researcher, they don't apply the same rule. On. So this, uh, uh, we need to keep our researchers at home and they need to cooperate with the EU from their base in Egypt. And this is a difficult formula that we have to, to implement, particularly in these difficult times. In this article, Dr. Michael Harms was uh, uh, interviewed and he mentioned some uh, positive, uh, mostly positive remarks, I have to say. Uh, and I would like him to, 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 to tell us, share with us, what the DAD has in the pipes, because the DAD has been very active since the revolution in Egypt, and I, I, I really like to commend their efforts in, in, in stepping up their activities after the revolution. So I'd like to give him here uh, a few minutes to highlight what they've been doing and what they have in the pipelines since the revolution, revolution uh, occurred in Egypt. Yes, thank you. Well, first of all, uh, I would also like to comment on, um, on the article and, you know, the um, frustration, uh, possible frustration in the community. Well, I mean, what they say is quite true, I think. Rome wasn't built in a day. Uh, we are a bit more than one year down the road, and to believe that you can turn a system, you know, within the space of a year is impossible. I think what is important is to, um, to make the right steps and to go into the right directions. And I think that um, the um, higher education and the research system are going into the right direction. We have seen when it comes to uh, to reforming uh, the ways universities are run, for instance. We have seen free elections of presidents and uh, deans. I think that's very important. Uh, and we have seen a lot of readiness as well to, uh, to look for partners for international collaboration. And I think that's, um, that's a very good uh, way ahead in actually transforming um, the <coughs> research uh, system in this country. What are we doing? Well, first of all, um, uh, we are, as the DRD, we have received quite considerable funds to support this transformation uh, process. In fact, this is only part of a package that um, the German government has offered Egypt as a country. Uh, it's all under the label, under the umbrella of uh, the transformation partnership. And the DRD has the mandate to uh, support this process in the realm of, of uh, science and uh, technology, in the realm of higher education. And in fact, we are doubling of what we did uh, before. And as you can, as can uh, see from what has been said so far, um, we haven't really been inactive uh, throughout the years before. So we are doubling and we have a range of new programs. First of all, we are uh, giving the opportunity for more university partnerships and this is on the ground, on the faculty or institute level. Um, we have uh, called for that by the end of uh, last year and we have now 20 new projects running and this is uh, quite some considerable money, we're talking 120,000 euros every year for three years running. Um, this is one, this is the first line actually of the new transformation uh, partnership. We are still ongoing with a second uh, line or second strand, which is short-term measures. So all of you Egyptian researchers uh, who would like to work with German counterparts, here's the opportunity. Uh, if you have existing contacts, if you meet colleagues here at the BioVision, uh, if you meet them somewhere else, if you establish contacts via 
the internet. Um, this is the possibility to have uh, joint workshops, uh, to have summer schools, exchanges, invite German professors, go to Germany yourself. Um, this is all possible under this so-called line two or strand two of the uh, transformation partnership. Um, I know it's always dangerous to say, but funding is not the problem. Um, it's the quality. Uh, as long as you have uh, a good project, as long as you have uh, a sound partner, um, the uh, chances of getting supported um, over the next uh, two or three years are really uh, very, very fascinating indeed. Now the third strand, the third line, is uh, the um, <coughs> support of two completely new master programs. One will be in cultural heritage management. Again, this has been called for, and we are approaching the deadline soon. The other one will be, will be uh, in the uh, areas of uh, the social sciences. Now, the fourth one is interesting, as it has been mentioned implicitly uh, a couple of times now, and this is what uh, we would like to call reintegration program. I have to say a couple of words about that, because it actually links up to uh, one of our very important and successful uh, partnerships with the Egyptian Ministry um, of Higher Education. We are expecting the first cohort of uh, scholarship holders, PhD candidates, coming back to Egypt uh, at the end of the year. And I'm happy, uh, Hamid, to say that uh, they're not staying in Germany. Uh, we are not doing a brain drain. Uh, we actually make sure that these people return to, to Egypt, and we do that by helping in uh, providing attractive uh, workplace, we will try again to uh, equip the best one out of these with, uh, you know, research grants to set up their own research group, help a little with facilities, uh, get, you know, technical assistance and help them thus um, do actually conduct research here in Egypt uh, and not only, uh, you know, get uh, caught up in, uh, in teaching. So this is... Um, the plan, this has not been called for, this is uh, brand new as we speak, but will be implemented in the course of the second uh, half of this year. Thank you, Michael. Actually, I, I'm, a, I'm a fellow of the DAD, so I received a grant fellowship back in 1991. <coughs> and I have to say, uh, even since then, they had a small, though, reintegration grant. So I was... Uh, uh, allowed to to buy some equipment for my sm small equipment for my research lab but uh, it didn't apply to me because I wasn't working very much and it was not a research fellowship but uh, still the DAD offers everyone returning from their fellowship I think uh, a, a small uh, fund to do this and I hope that we, we, we have this we have more maybe strength more highlighting on this aspect of reintegration because definitely when we go abroad and we work and we feel very comfortable it's very difficult to come back if there are no incentives so we said before that maybe I will, I will please, add something else please. I mean the, is also uh, the mission department in the Ministry of Higher Education and this is a huge fund that is being spent every year uh, on people being sent outside Egypt uh, for getting their PhD we spend about 700 million Egyptian pound a year. They are also transforming their policy in cooperation with the Ministry of Scientific Research to be able to allow not only the amount of money and time they are spending on their PhD, but also when they come back, they will have the reintegration grant with it. So our policy for the next five years as Egyptian governments will be changing according to that, and the mission, most of the mission, not going to be all of them, but most of the missions will be directed to certain targets which are meeting the national demand and, and priorities, and at the same time allowing them the reintegration when they come back. So then this is the way how we can combat the, the, the effect of the brain drain. And we will definitely provide all the necessary support to the, any initiative that was coming from the DAD or any other part, partner working with us to be able to make sure that this reintegration initiative will, will succeed with Egyptian candidates. There are 
two quick questions and then the floor will be open for you. We said in the beginning that the way the EU cooperates with, with Egypt is as part of the Mediterranean, uh, one of the Mediterranean countries. And uh, we also stress that now we, are, we, have, we think more of our Mediterranean identity since all these uh, events in Egypt uh, in the past uh, year and a half. And the EU has also stepped up the, the cooperation with the Mediterranean or stepped up the, 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 the rethinking of cooperation with the Mediterranean through this conference, which was called the Euro-Mediterranean Conference on Research and Innovation, an agenda for renewed partnership. And this conference occurred on the 2nd and 3rd of April of this year. So early this month, we had this conference in Barcelona. And of course, Barcelona is very uh, symbolic because we have been cooperating with the EU through the Barcelona process since 1995. It was a very successful talk conference in terms of uh, words and, and energy, positive energy for this cooperation. But yet, I think there is a concern because we don't see that the EU is putting research and innovation as a top priority in their cooperation agenda with the Mediterranean countries. Meaning that definitely the directorate in the European Commission, which is Directorate of Research and Innovation that organized this conference, they definitely meant very good and the conference was very successful as long as they are concerned. But I would like now to ask Shur, do you think that research is really going to be a priority on the Euro-Mediterranean cooperation agenda? Well, Hamid uh, likes very much to ask difficult questions. <laughs> Let me see, uh, yes, in Barcelona, we had a successful conference, but I think all conferences are successful at the end of the day. Now, was it a really successful conference? Let's go back one year, uh, April 2011, just after the revolution here in Egypt, Tunisia, Libya, etc., what we call the Arab Spring, and then what Europe did at this moment. We have uh, the cooperation instrument, the main cooperation instrument we have is the neighboring policy, what we call the neighboring policy. This is through the neighboring policy and its instruments that we provide uh, we cooperate in, in many sectors with Egypt, with Morocco, with Tunisia, etc. Immediately, in April 2011, the European Union reviewed the, this neighboring policy with Mediterranean countries. This review was, I, I think, a, a profound review in terms of objectives and also in budgetary terms. There is a strong increase at the level of 30% of the, of the cooperation policy. Now, at this moment, it is true the cooperation in research was not high in the agenda. But what we did at this moment, last April 2011, we said we will organize a conference with the main stakeholders and to see if there is interest to go ahead with a more, with a more active cooperation in research and innovation. So we organized the Barcelona conference on the 2nd and 3rd of April with uh, 300 people, almost, I think, the main policy makers from north of Mediterranean and south Mediterranean were present. And what came out from this conference? Let me open a parenthesis. We were speaking in the beginning about the framework prog program projects where Egypt participates. If you take these projects and you look them under a microscope, you will see that the links between the Egyptian researchers and 
or Moroccan researchers, Tunisian researchers, with the north of Mediterranean Sea are mostly with countries like Italy, France, Germany, Spain, Greece, Cyprus, the neighboring countries plus Germany. So we have to realize that the cooperation with the Mediterranean countries is of very high in the agenda of many countries, but certainly not all the countries of Europe. The countries in the northern part of, of Europe, of course, they, they have some cooperation with Mediterranean countries, but certainly not as active as other countries. So what we propose to do is to have a specific program which will be based on a voluntary basis. Those member states who wish to participate will participate. For, uh, in order to, to, to understand better this program, we, we had a similar, we still have a similar program with uh, research issues concerning the Baltic Sea. The Baltic Sea is of interest to the neighboring countries of the Baltic Sea, but certainly not for my own country, for Greece or for Spain. So Greece and Spain don't participate, but the other countries around the Baltic Sea, they do participate. We will have something similar at the level of Mediterranean. We will ask the ministers of the 27 member countries, do you wish to participate in a Euromed program with the southern Mediterranean countries? And this will happen next June. We expect that all the neighboring countries that I mentioned before, uh, Germany also, certainly Switzerland, I don't know, Belgium, but many countries will, will accept on a voluntary base to participate, to create a huge program between, a huge program between uh, Europe and the Mediterranean countries. So <coughs> this is the, the plan. So we start from very small, and I do hope that in one year, because this will take at least one year of discussions with the ministers, we will have a big program in research and innovation between the European countries interested by this participation and the Mediterranean countries. In, in all, of course, in all fields, in, in fields of interest to both sides, like energy, uh, health, water, agriculture, research, etc., and innovation. Thank I you. was a bit long, sorry, but I think it is, uh, it is an important issue. Of course. It is so I am very optimistic about the future, in we one word. We all know. It is a very important program that George was telling you, and one thing maybe that is very important to mention, that this program between the interested countries in the, in the North and the South Mediterranean is going to be based on co-funding between both sides. So we are not going to receive money from Europe as aid money, but this they will be involved on equal footage and there will be co-ownership from the countries of the South Mediterranean because they're going to put money in this cooperation. And this is an example, by the way, that we have been pushing. This is a model that Egypt has been pushing for for several years now, and we've been not only asking for it, but we've been implementing it with member states from the EU through bilateral funds from the Science and Technology Development Fund. So I'd like here to ask Dr. Sharif about what is the impact of this uh, bilateral cooperation, particularly when it comes to uh, co-funding this cooperation. Have you really noticed that this, the cooperation now, that, that, that our researchers feel more ownership for this program? Are we really uh, uh, joining in designing this program or we're getting some 
ready design program and we have to just follow it. Well, uh, all these bilateral uh, programs, they are designed uh, by, uh, through uh, mutual agreement. Yeah, and you, the agreement on the funding uh, value, on the topics, all this is done after uh, consulting with the different uh, parties. So uh, it is a real partnership rather than uh, just uh, cooperation. And uh, <clears throat> of course, at the same time, it is uh, important yeah, that we uh, mention that uh, these have been done for uh, quite some time now, and uh, the, the rate of success of the projects and the continuity of these projects when they are compared to the uh, projects which are done here uh, locally, it is uh, higher. Uh, the, the quality of work, of course, is also higher. And uh, after some of these uh, projects are uh, approaching uh, their end, uh, we, we find that some of the researchers, uh, the Egyptian researchers, they begin to apply to the national uh, research grants and they uh, try to uh, work further in the, uh, in the same field to build on the results of this uh, these uh, projects. Uh, in addition, of course, there is the uh, development of the uh, research uh, community by uh, having the, mobili the mobility grants. Uh, this has also a very important uh, effect on the uh, development of uh, the, the local uh, research uh, and development capabilities, because uh, the people who uh, go back there, they they acquire uh, not just some uh, kind of uh, new knowledge in science or, uh, or technology, but they also uh, acquire the, the way of dealing, how to manage uh, projects, how to uh, uh, try to uh, expose the, their scientific uh, research. All these things are uh, of importance, of course, resulting from these partnerships. Thank you, Dr. Sharif. So, definitely international cooperation is important. Cooperation with the EU as our northern neighbors are important, is also important. We just have to structure this cooperation. And this is why we have the EU Egypt Year of Science. I would like you now to, to open, to give the floor to you to uh, mention any comments, questions, or suggestions for the uh, Year of Science. Please just, when you take the floor, just mention your name and uh, uh, work. And uh, also, uh, please say which the question is addressed to which panelist. There are two microphones here, so you could use uh, any of them. Please. Um, my name's Morris Berry. Um, I'm speaking here. I've been here a few times. It's very interesting. Um, Your name, please? Morris Berry. Sorry. Oh, sorry. sorry. Um, the question I have is how can we deconstruct what you were all saying? Uh, are we talking about uh, money grants being allocated for PhD studentships? Are we talking about further research that may become or have commercial applicability? Uh, you know, I mean, the money that you mentioned, Michael, from, from Germany, I think 200,000, I think you said, every, every year for three years. No? I, I don't know how much, whatever, but, uh, but I was just doing my, I had 200,000, and to put that in, 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 in context, you know, in, in the life, this is biovision, after all, in life science, this is uh, maybe 10, maybe 15 proof of concept grants to actually go further down the line in, in biotechnology or healthcare. So I'm just trying to put in context whether you're allocating these funds, but so it's really to all of you how you're working together, at what level you're looking at at building the infrastructure. Uh, because obviously, you know, picking a few cherries at the top is not really good for the foundation, the bedrock that you require. So I'm just looking. The other question I have, which is perhaps more important, is, you know, I think it's fantastic that you uh, are, are 
are working with you, but I'm not sure if it's just EU and Egypt, because I was at the Innovation and Healthcare one in Brussels. That spoke about Africa. Uh, so I'm a bit confused about, you know, EU and Mediterranean and EU and Africa. Uh, I find that a bit confusing. And lastly, and most importantly, perhaps, why are you not in closer collaboration or cooperation, however you want to put it, with the likes of Qatar, Amman, the oil-rich neighbors that you have? They have far more cash than the EU has floating around. <laughs> and just to put this in perspective again, the final thing is that the National Institute of Health in America has $33 billion a year. So if we translate the 80 billion euros that will be distributed in the EU over the next seven years, that's 100 140 billion dollars divided by seven, so that's two, sorry, so it's 20 billion dollars a year. So it's less than the US. That isn't the issue. The issue is that the US is far more successful with its public funding at actually producing a bedrock of science that is academic all the way through to becoming a commercial entity that returns or has potential to get taken up by a corporate entity. The EU is not as successful at that. It is successful in funding, but it does not produce hard, hard proof of concept, proof of principle, preclinical, or even phase one data companies. Those are my questions. I think you need Can a I conference to answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, these are very important points. I will take a few more questions. I noted the three, the three points you made, no, no, very, very, uh, uh, very good points. And uh, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll answer them uh, uh, later on after taking a few questions. My name is Hassan Abdel Fattah, uh, and I want to know uh, what things uh, that the uh, EU will be concerned to, re uh, to get the research about it. Yeah, in what fields? And what fields the, the EU will be interested in doing research with Egypt? <coughs> okay. Please. My name is Dina Taha from the Faculty of Engineering. Um, as you said, the bottleneck does not uh, lie at um, the scarcity of money. There is money. But it lies in having good research, a good proposal, right, a good proposal, and having a good team. But I guess there is another bottleneck we did not uh, address today. It's the bureaucracy we face here. One of them is, from personal experience, is the national security that we need their acceptance for our scientific researchers. So how come does this agency judge our scientific research? And what is its real role? Uh, my name is Hanan Ghoslan. I'm in Faculty of Science, Alexandria University. Um, I've, first, I would like to thank all people on the, on the stage for the information given to us now. Uh, Dr. Sherbini, I think 4% is very low. When you have two, 270 applicants and you give grants only for 10 people, this is very depressing, and this is not the only case. Also, the STDF, they were giving grants for very few people. It's very depressing. You can just widen the ground. You can give hope for everybody, even if with small grants. You don't have to minimize and give less people. This is only one comment. The <coughs> German experience, I have been uh, working with the Germans for, for some time. And I think the experience after 30 years cooperation with Germans, even with PhD students, as Morris has said, now we have links with Germans just because a lot of PhD students, they were working in Germany. And if I think by any means to find collaborators, I will find in Germany very easily. But for example, in Spain, I have problems. In France, they don't know what is uh, FP7. <laughs> if you talk about PhD collaboration, you will find the floor is not ready for that. And they, you have to explain to them every basic thing, what you are talking about. In, there is also a problem to form a consortium in Europe, with Europe. Unless they have the initiative and they have the project and you have to in integrate yourself into their projects, 
Otherwise, you have no chance to find collaborators. Uh, we have, I have a, an experience to form a consortium in Europe. I traveled specifically to Spain, and uh, we had very tough negotiation concerning the budget. There is a high ego in Europe. If you're talking about the budget, then they want to keep all the money in Europe. And uh, I think now it, you have to have a revolution talking to scientific uh, people in, in Europe. We have to help South, uh, South Mediterranean to develop. It's not, the point now is not the research. It's not developing research in Europe or in Egypt. It's how to develop the society in Southern Mediterranean that to have more support for the euros against the dollars. Think about that. You have to compete with Americans in South Mediterranean. We have a very good floor for the Europeans in South Mediterranean. I think this is a different language. We are not talking about only research. We have to develop villages for small industries with European support. Did you think about that? We don't have only to talk about nanotechnology. We also have to talk about small investments, how to do it, how to uh, minimize the unemployment, how to help people to develop themselves. And this is what the Germans were very successful in doing that. And also Italians, but in different channels. Please think about it, because I think this is a good opportunity for Europeans also in South Mediterranean. I am Ahmed El Bayali. I am uh, a student at the Faculty of Medicine here at Alexandria. It was a previous film labor, uh, but I beg uh, the audience to talk in Arabic. I to talk Arabic, so we are Arab. Ahmed, there are people who have been in the panel and are not speaking Arabic. If you want to speak Arabic, you can speak Arabic. I can speak more with the Arabic. I can speak with the Arabic and I will speak with the Arabic. Please, please. يعني هي النقط دي التعليقات واقتراحات واسئله في نفس الوقت اقولها بسرعه جدا هو اول حاجه ضروره الخروج من العزله في مصر فمش معقول ان احنا في القرن ال21 يعني هنستعيد ذكريات جماعات التكفير والهجره ثانيا ان هو يعني مستحيل ان يكون هناك ابداع مع الاذلال والاخضاع والدوله الامنيه فلا بد من اسقاط ومحاربه عسكره الدوله عشان يبقى في نوع من الحريه في الابداع <تصفيق> آه كمان يعني اعتقد انه مستحيل الاستفاده من التعاون العلمي بدون الاحتفاظ باللغه العربيه وانا هنا احيل الحضور الى قراءه كتاب آه الدبليو اتش او منظمه الصحه العالميه آه المعنون حتميه تدريس الطب باللغه العربيه احنا مش بنقول ما ندرس بالانجليزي او نعلمش لاتيني بس احنا كطلبه حتى بعد التخرج بنقابل مشكله كبيره جدا مش عارفين نتعامل مع اللغه السيمبل بتاعه الناس اللي هي كمان مش عربي دي الناس بتيجي من الارياف من الصعيد فاحنا عشان نقدر نستفيد لازم احنا الاول نتعلم عربي اه ليه اوروبا بتحب تيجي الشرق الاوسط اه الاجابه واحده عشان احنا عندنا عقول نابغه اه اعتقد ان التركيز على التعاون في في العلوم هو افضل من التركيز على الحاجات اللي هي فيها جوانب يعني ابعاد سياسيه بحته انا ايضا احيي الحضور على يعني مشاهده فيلم الجزيره الوثائقيه اللي هو الاتحاد من اجل المتوسط ولد ميتا انه ليس من المعقول ان اامن انا على نفسي وانا اكون سوف اكون باحث ان ادخل ضمن اتحاد اول دوله في اسرائيل ثم فلسطين ثم مصر يعني كيف اامن على نفسي ان انا عايز افيد بلدي اما ارجع تاني زي ما دكتور ماجد قال بالظبط عايزين نطلع بره ناخد العلم ونرجع نفيد بيه بلادنا والا يبقى احنا مالناش لازمه ان احنا لما بنطلع بره ما بنعرفش نرجع تاني للاسف الغلط من هنا من مصر عشان كده احنا عايزين نشجع الناس اللي بره ترجع واعتقد ان احنا مصر يمكن فيها اكتر من 200 الف عالم بره متميزين معظمهم في الذره عشان كده شايف ان المانيا تكون افضل من فرنسا مثلا في التعاون مع مصر لان اعتقد ان صعود اليمين المتطرف في فرنسا دي عقبه قويه جدا يعني في في التعاون واخيرا احب ان اذكر قول نزار قباني الكاتب في وطني يتكلم كل لغات العالم الا العربيه فلدينا لغه مرعبه قد سدوا فيها كل ثقوب الحريه شكرا يا احمد آه آه
I will, I will translate uh, uh, as much as possible what Ahmed said. Uh, it was a political discourse, actually. <laughs> First, he said that we want to exit exclusion. And I, I think here he means a scientific exclusion. And uh, then he said there's no creativity uh, while we are being uh, ruled by the military. This will kill our creativity. And I agree, with, and I agree with you. Military. Military. And then he said that we need to uh, promote our Arabic language and use it. And here he mentioned uh, also that we need to learn medicine. I don't know why in particular medicine. Talib al Ahmed? Because he's a medical student. He said we need to learn medicine in Arabic and I totally disagree. But uh, this, is, uh, this is a debate. This is in parallel. In Spain, and I think the lady was speaking about Spain, in Spain, Catalonia is always fighting for... Uh, yeah. They published their PhDs in Catalan. Okay? Nobody else could read them. Yeah. And they were resolute in sticking to their guns. Catalan, Catalan, Catalan. That's changed because they realized they had to dem disseminate their research. So I'm not saying, you know, don't be proud of your language. In, in Europe at the moment, so Wales, well, the Welsh language is resurgent. More people are speaking Welsh than ever. But they're still speaking in English and publishing in English because it is the accepted international language. And I'm so, I apologize for not speaking Arabic or not reading it, but I do speak Spanish, I do speak a bit of French. So I, I think you're right. You can't just have one language, it, it, otherwise you won't reach out to the world. It's a long debate. It's a long debate. He said in parallel, yes. Oh, so to, to, be, to be correct, he said in parallel. To be, yeah. To be, you know, medical students have enough uh, load on it. But anyway, and then he also uh, mentioned that the union, he, he also uh, recommended, uh, 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 <coughs> he recommended the documentary uh, in Gezira, on the Gezira channel, which uh, t is titled, The Union for the Mediterranean Was Born Dead. Recommended us to watch it. And uh, I, think, I think these are very briefly the points that Ahmed uh, raised. So now we're going to uh, address the questions and then we're going to go for a second round of, of questions. I would. Uh, okay. Uh, أنا أحمد منصور أنا أتكلم بالعربي عشان بس يبقى أنا أحمد منصور صحفي وناشط سياسي طبعا أنا دكتور أحمد أثر كان حافظت يعني بالنسبة لكلامه فأنا بس عايز مش هرد عليه بس عايز إيه أقرب من الرؤى يعني إحنا دلوقتي عالم مفتوح يعني يعني مصر دولة محورية في وسط أوروبا وأفريقيا وآسيا فاحنا عايزين بس عشان نغير مصر لازم نغير نفسينا ولازم نغير فكرنا فلا انا عايز اقوله للدكتور احمد ان دلوقتي العالم تكامل مش تضاد يعني احنا مش بنحارب بعض او يعني سجال قد ما هو تكامل دي النقطه اللي انا عايز ارد عليه فيها طبعا محمد علي عمل الكلام ده من 150 سنة بعد بعثات لاوروبا غير بها مصر كلها جمال عبد الناصر بعد بعثات برضو وغير مصر برضو بالفكر الروسي وقبل منه ناس كتير قوي عملوا الكلام ده ف... هم طبعا في مصر هنا الناس السياسيين والبوليتيشن بيلعبوا لعب حلو قوي كده وقت ما يحبوا يقول لك خافوا من أوروبا يقول لك تمويل أجنبي مش عارف ايه الفزاعات اللي بتصة دي يقول لك في غزو ثقافي وكلام الخزع بلاد ده انت اهم حاجة دماغك فيها ايه دماغك هي اللي بتعمل فلتريشن للأفكار تاخد الكويس وتسيب الوحش ما تلبس بنطلون قصير وتقول أنا إسلامي يعني لازم نتغير ولازم نفكر بطريقة أوسع أو globalization يعني أكتر نشوف الريسيرشز رايحة فين ونستفيد منها في ريسيرشز ما تعملها أوروبا مش متوافقة مع ديننا ومش متوافقة مع أخلاقنا نرفضها والريسيرشز المتوافقة مع أخلاقنا ومع أدبنا ومع عادتنا ونقدر نستفيد منها نستفيد منه بس ده اللي انا عايزه وشكرا شكرا يا احمد
Okay, it, it was uh, answering the previous one in uh, another political discourse. Uh, we're glad to have political discourse here. There's no separation, especially after uh, the revolution. Uh, politics is everywhere. Uh, but we just would like to use also the, the panelists' experience, uh, and then we could uh, we could discuss all of this. So, please, I would like to ask you to limit your intervention to uh, the theme of uh, of the day. If politics is is included in the theme, we we're very happy to have it. But if it's not, if it's something on the side, then we can discuss it uh, outside. Uh, بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم محمد طارق انا ماجستير في كليه علوم طالب ماجستير زولوجي قسم حيوان وفي نفس الوقت ناشط سياسي برضو حضرتك عايز اقول على حاجتين داخليا حضرتك اي حد مسؤول بيطلع يقول لك احنا بنسند الطلبه والدكاتره والباحثين اول ما حد يجي يتكلم معاه وجها لوجه يقول له ما لكوش حاجه عندنا روحوا اعملوا اللي انتوا عايزينه اطلعوا بره يا شاطر ما لكش حاجه عندنا على راسهم الدكتور هاني هلال وزير التعليم العالي السابق في نفس الوقت برضو المشاريع اللي جايه من بره بتقتصر على ناس معينه اللي هي نظام وسايط من الاخر كده اهوت اه طبعا هقولها بصراحه هقولها بصراحه اللي هو يعرف فلان ولا علان ده اللي هو يصفره انما ال بني ادم المغضوب عليه زي ما بيقولوا كده اهوت العادي اللي ملوش اي واسطه اتفضل انت مع السلامه مالكش حاجه عندنا حضرتك احنا حتى لو حاولنا ان احنا نقدم في اوروبا بيحصل فلتريشن نطلع احنا من اي من اي سلكشن في من اي اختيار تبع اوروبا النظره الدونيه العرب والمسلمين طبعا لا هتكلم فعلا حصل مثال على كده فعلا انا حاولت حضرتك انا حصلت على الفضل اللي عشان التويفل والاي سي دي ال والالماني وقدمت في جامعات في اوروبا ويحصل على طول سلكشن ما فيش حاجه عندنا تبع افريقيا او الشرق الاوسط ما ما يتقبلش عندنا ولا تدخل امتحان خالص لان هي دي نظره دونيه مع ان فعلا احنا اللي علمنا احنا اللي علمنا فعلا اوروبا العلم في الوقت كانت اوروبا فعلا كانت بتزحف على التراب في العصور الوسطى اوكي طيب خلي خلي بقى معلش شكرا محمد اتفضل اتفضل بس سريعا سريعا ها سريعا وات محمد واز سايينج از از ات از ات از بوليتيكال بس اتس اولسو ريليتد بس اتس اولسو ريليتد تو وات وات وي ديسكسينج بيكوز هي از claiming that it's not easy to have missions and people are selected and he's talking about uh, some corruption and uh, but anyway تفضل ما انا مش هلحق محمد اقول كل حاجه عشان عشان الوقت okay and محمد will be uh, محمد okay he's going to win the nobel prize in 2020 تفضل <laughs> محمد لبيب سالم بروفيسور اوف هيومنولوجي ات تانتا يونيفرستي اكشوالي اي ثينك ذا بانل ديسكشن فيري ماتش اند اتس فيري فروتفول فور اس اند وي لارن ات ا لوت ذا اون ذا فيرست اكشوالي نوت كريتيسيز مش جاست كومنت از ذات وي هيرد اباوت ذا ذا وي ار اور اوبتيمستيك اوف كورس بات اون ذا جراوند اي جيس دازنت ات ليست فور مي اي دونت فيل فيري اوبتيمستيك in terms of uh, the reduction, the significant reduction of the, uh, of the uh, budget funding, especially from uh, STDF and the uh, Professor Shibin mentioned clearly that this year will be a significant reduction from 5% to 1%. This is crisis. And uh, this is what I understood. Maybe I'm wrong. I would clarify. Yeah, clarify. yeah. So I hope not, of course. Uh, I, of course, I'm looking for increasing because I'm a researcher and uh, most of my research is based on funding. And this is really <laughs> critical for all of us. So uh, we heard about the uh, problems, but I, I wanted really to uh, hear from you, especially you are the poli policy maker in the country, the top of the uh, policy maker about the alternative. If we have a limitation in budget, we need to learn. We need to hear from you very specifically very specific points, one, two, three, four, what is alternative? 
Are, are you expecting donations from uh, businessmen? Are you expecting uh, from abroad and what kind of sources? This is very critical because uh, if we don't hear this, then how can we uh, plan for uh, our future? This is one thing. The second thing, uh, this is uh, actually for Professor Sharif, uh, and I guess I discussed with him this briefly before about the renewable project. I myself enjoy a project from uh, STDF, <coughs> and it helped me a lot to establish. Can I Costa? What? Of course. Can I take Costa to Ah, this is actually very important. But I didn't come. I didn't come. Yes, yes. Take Costa from the Of course, I don't agree with him at all. Uh, just by myself. Uh, and it's generous funding, actually. So anyway, uh, what I'm really looking for, I enjoyed some, uh, this is very important, I'm sorry if I take more time, but I enjoyed uh, getting some grants from US, and one very important, important grant is renewable grant. This allows you to hire postdoc and also postgraduate students, and you can renew the grant after five years or something is called in from NIH is R01. I, I, I myself enjoyed this uh, for one round. So I, I hope really to have this one because it, uh, I cannot imagine after I establish my lab for two years or three years, and then if I cannot renew my grant, then what can I do? This is very- Mohammed, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Dr. Ahmed, just uh, one more question for uh, Professor Maggid is about the mission department. They, I enjoyed myself too. One, uh, mission to uh, uh, Japan in 1992, but now I think we don't need more students to send them abroad. We spend 700 million a year for students. We can reduce this and turn it into local funding, and then we can, uh, any professor who hire postgraduate students or something can help send them through this project to, for a year or something. But we cannot just keep sending, and you know, uh, better than me that they uh, wait there and they don't go back uh, to Egypt. Shukran to Mohammed. Shukran. Yeah, that's all. I have more but little. Shukran. وحضرتك اثنين اخر سؤالين تفضل. My name is Mohammed Yahya. I'm the editor of Nature Middle East from the publishers of Nature. My question is, it wouldn't take a few seconds really. Uh, Dr. Zuhairi mentioned how it would be possible to maximize the benefits that Egypt gets from the uh, FP7, for example. And one common complaint that I've heard several times is that uh, people who are applying for grants, they don't know how to write their application. And I think this is a common problem here because a lot of the researchers, they're not familiar with the strict requirements, I would say, of the EU when applying for that. So it would be interesting to see how that can be uh, how that can be how that can be solved? Does it need to more education for the uh, researchers themselves, or the, do the uh, uh, grants themselves need to change in a way to make it easier for the people to apply? Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Samia Matkur. I'm a professor of plant physiology with the University of Damanhu. I just uh, wanted to ask uh, George about FP8. I was interested to hear about it because I've tried to join FP7, but it wasn't open for, for my area of research. Uh, it's environment and climate change. So um, I wanted to know when is it going to be launched and where to get information about it and about the areas of research uh, which are earmarked for uh, funding. Because I already have the consortium and working on the project since last year, but I could not apply. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to start very quickly by asking Khaled, please, could you stand up? Khaled Saadani is the focal point of the RDI program in Alexandria University, and he is responsible for the framework program for disseminating information. So the last two, two interventions. It's actually Khaled and his team and Alexandria University are very successful in this, who orient researchers about how to write proposals, and this is his uh, job. And we have uh, uh, an office like this in every university in Egypt. Thank you, Khaled. We will start uh, chronologically. We have a lot of questions. Um, okay, so Morris, you started by uh, uh, mentioning uh, uh, three, three things, the funds, for uh, are they PhD or research funds? 
uh, we're talking about a variety of different funds, yeah, it's, we cannot say. Uh, but he, he mentioned also building the infrastructure and the EU, Mediterranean and EU Africa. I, I, I don't understand. The Innovation Healthcare Conference, which was last week, yes. basically was discussing about Europe and Africa. Yeah. You could argue, argue that DJ for North Africa is Africa, so okay. I don't see where the Mediterranean fits into. Okay, I, I'll be happy to, to, to tell you this later, but also you mentioned a very important point, which is the uh, Qatar and, the, and, and uh, Oman, and why we're not uh, getting funds from Qatar. We're not here to get funds from Europe, by the way. We're here to do uh, cooperation, but, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but we'd like to, uh, to um, I think this funding from Qatar, maybe Professor Shibini could, uh, could uh, uh, address this, and also, please, Professor Shibini, while you're there, uh, could also address the administrative issues that uh, uh, Dina Taha w w was mentioning, uh, that administrative issues are also a hurdle to this cooperation. She mentioned specific uh, uh, bureaucracy about with, with the national also security having to approve. Uh, so Professor Shibini, could you please address these two issues and other issues, of course, that you would see fit? Um, first of all, I would like to, to answer some of your comments and questions is that we don't expect one partner will be able to suffice all our needs. So that's why we have a program for international cooperation with many partners all over the world. Europe, US, Japan, everywhere. And we understand fully that uh, maybe the US is more successful in bringing product into the markets. Uh, even China can do that better than anybody else. The Europe has a certain nature for its type of collaboration and we are matching our needs according to that but we don't match what we want according to the partner. What we put is that we put our priorities and then we say the best partner to fit with us on this priority is this group and then we work with them. What we have learned through working with Europe on, on different programs and maybe some of you here uh, uh, talked about uh, that uh, the people get the projects and I'm sure that if you ask each of the individuals in the room now about project, they will tell you it has to be based on quality and competitiveness. That's the only conditions we have right now. We don't have a condition attached to it, and I'm, I'm saying these words for the, for what's his name, uh, uh, Ahmad Mansour, who was saying that, uh, you know, he never gets things, you know, but, but it is based solely on these two things. Not who are you are related to, or who is your in favor, or that. This is, is long gone. This has been there in the Egyptian environment before, but not anymore. We are doing our best to make sure, to make sure that this is the way that we are going. Well, if, 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 it's, if it is still with you, then there is an individual case, and we need, to, we need to discuss it with you individually. But I'm talking about the Egyptian environment right now. The most important thing here is that uh, uh, in, in regard with Europe, we have learned through the collaboration with them how to build this capability in our own institution for competitiveness and for reviewing projects and to work that. But it is still difficult for us, as you mentioned, that some of the people does not, were, are not able to get the project, mainly because they cannot suffice the criteria and the tough competitiveness happening. We have to learn that we are working in an environment, both in Egypt, our rate now, and Dr. Sharif can say that, is around 20 to 25 percent who succeed in the project not because of the money as one issue, but also of the quality. And this is the regular rate internationally. So we are competing with the money from all over the world as well as the money from Egypt here. So we have to learn this sense and this capability of doing uh, quality research on based on competitiveness. But it's an issue. You are absolutely right in saying that we are opening the door and then the finances there are limited, so we are not too able to suffice everybody. And this is the, the reality. That's why we are saying 0.4% is not enough to work with. We need to have at least 2%. You ask it about the question, what are the alter I'm trying to collectively, maybe I'm not going to go individually, but I will try to answer collectively. One of you asked about what are the alternatives for making the funding? What are the things if we are, the government is, uh, I didn't say 1 to 5%, I meant the economic growth. I didn't mean the funding. The economic growth of Egypt was 5 to 7 percent every year. But due what is happening now, the economic growth is around 1 percent. But the funding is increasing, increasing in a small amount. 
We were, four years ago, we were 0.2%. Now we are 0.4%. And we are getting close to 0.5%. But is 0.5, 0.4 is enough? Is what we need to have? No. The minimum is 1%, and we hope we can get to 2%. But to get to 2% on the Egyptian government support only will be very difficult to ask, unless the economic growth is very high and we have enough money. But we don't. So that's why we need the NGOs, we need the private industries to come in and step and believe in science and technology and support that. We believe that they should be able, all the countries in the world, Germany, France, Japan, US, their funding is 4% maybe, 5%, but 70% come from NGOs and industries. They don't come from the government. Here we have 89% coming from the government right now. So we need to change this mentality. We need to make them believe and to be able to attract them to come and fund with us. And I think there is very good proof of concept and examples. But are they enough? No. There are some examples, good examples like the RDI, like what's happening at the SDF, but we need more of that. I will... No, I no, so, uh, as we as we listen to you, we سمعنا لك لازم تدينا فرصة نتكلم ورد عليك بعدين نتكلم تاني لكن ما ينفعش نقاطع. الجزء التاني the, the second part I would like to say is that we are Egypt is blessed by its geographical location. We are part of the Arab world. We are part of the Mediterranean. We are part of Africa, and we are very proud of doing this. We are very active with Africa. And we are even had our own initiative in Africa called Era Africa. And Abdul Hamid can mention more of that and Dr. Sharif. We are with other African countries putting funding together from our own resources to be able to work on projects like that. And we are extending that with Europe, Era, Era Net and Era Net Plus, and we are working with them on that. And the Arab region, we are collaborating with many Arab countries. Not so many, and believe me, the most important thing is not the money, the issue of the money. It's the common target we need to put on and the will to pursue the target. We believe we, are, we were able to put what is called the Arab Consolidated Plan of Science and Technology. I was one part of this plan, and we put it for 22 Arab countries. But unfortunately, the political situation is not the right one to be able to formulate among them such a plan. So we hope in the future you will be able to see that because one of you said partnership and globalization is the keys now. We are, nobody can work in, 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 in solitary confinement. Um, I will address the issue of, well, nobody will answer you on this, but uh, it's a bureaucracy. We, we suffer from a lot of bureaucracy which are created by our own hands sometimes. But we have to understand the needs before we can you know, point fingers to anything. National security is your own security. National security is your own liability of the country. And you should be able to understand why they are worried and why you could explain to them that. Maybe you can then make it clearer for you. For instance, I will give an example on this. We only have issues with security on very few things. Few things which are related to what? Related to genetic material, related to material that can be we have suffered a lot over the many years in the past from people coming and taking some of the samples we have, some of the material, some of the no indigenous knowledge we have. And we are, you know, we're so a little bit naive, not knowing our traditional knowledge and our importance of the material we have, we gave it to them. And then they are able, because they have the finances, they have the resources, they were able to develop it into a product a pharmaceutical product, for instance, and then it comes back to you without any share from your side. So this was an issue. We need to be able to look after our interests. Every country in the world <coughs> has its own security matters. In the US, they have it. It's called ITAR. In different places, they have it. Some of them are apparent for you, and some of them are not apparent for you. But sometimes, when the issue is clouded so many times over and over and over, it becomes everybody feel it. And I believe now we are in the situation where everybody feel it because people are still learning. What are the things we need to come? What are the things we need to apply for? What are the things we should not think of? So I think that it requires some more educational. 
in this. And I'm, I'm happy to explain to any of you any of these issues, what are the things. Close to you, there's two colleagues who have some problem now with some of the programs they are applying for. And we are working with them how to solve it. Through this process, we learn, they learn, the security issues also learn. It, it, you, we have to understand that. I mean, it's not, it's not something imposed. There's nothing imposed now. It's very clear. But we have to understand what are the reasons behind these lines. It's simple as that. But I don't think that we will be able to say, no, we don't want that to be in our life. It has to be there. And we have to work it out with a rationale and with a good advice and a very good time and an amount of time to be able to address these issues. I, uh, I don't think that I will, uh, will, will have much more to say uh, based on the other things, but uh, I think that I try to cover most of the, what has been said. Thank you very so. much. Uh, Michael. Yes, Morris, I think you addressed uh, myself um, and a couple of, of, um, of uh, funding figures. Actually, thank you for giving me the opportunity to clarify that. No, 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 that, that's fine. I, w I was actually um, mentioning one single, you know, program line, uh, just to give you a, a few ideas. Um, annual budget, around about 550 million US dollars, so this makes us the biggest scholarship organization in the world. Um, around about 65,000 scholarships every year. We have around about um, 80, 867 uh, last year Egyptians we supported. Um, and we spend about uh, 8 million euro on that uh, last year. And we are going to double that, you know, to more than 15 million, okay, with the additional programs I, I mentioned that. And I'm particularly proud that uh, I can say that uh, more than 90 percent, 90, um, of the uh, people, Egyptian people we support come back to this country. And I would like to also use the opportunity to talk uh, about something that I think uh, our friend Ahmed um, has raised. Actually, to give you an idea, we have, um, together with our friends from the, um, the higher education ministry, we have the opportunity and the funds available to support 81 young doctoral candidates every year going to Germany. This is every year, okay? Uh, in fact, um, the lion share of this program is coming from the Egyptian side, 70%, uh, and the remaining 30% are uh, chipped in uh, by the DRD, by the German side. Uh, 82 and 52, we actually closed um, the line this year. Why? We had more than 220 applications, but simply the people were not good enough. You see? The candidates were not good enough. And so this is for us and for our partners as well. We just closed the line because um, we want to make sure that these people are actually successful. We want it for their good selves because we do not want them to uh, spend a bad time. We do not want the, the lab in Germany to spend a bad time, and, and that's about it. We have a lot more instruments than that. You know, it's not just the, the doctoral programs. Uh, those candidates may apply for short-term visits. Um, they may apply for other programs, but uh, quality and competition, you know, uh, are the categories we, we believe in. Um, and this is something I think uh, has uh, proven uh, in science to be the right way. Uh, maybe I, will, I would also add on the mission thing, because uh, one of the colleagues here mentioned that we don't need to send more people. We don't need to spend the 700 million every year. I would tell you one thing only. China was uh, sending maybe a couple of thousand every year. Now they are sending 300,000 per year. The human is the most important factor of all, everything we are doing. If we don't build, build the critical mass, I'm not saying this because to clap. I'm saying this because this is the reality, and we have to maintain that. We are cutting the 700 million out of our budget to be able to give it to the people to go and learn and come back. So they have to value that. I'm saying this because a lot of you are young. Most of you have benefited from chances like this, and some of you will be benefiting in the future. So you have to learn that we are taking this money from anywhere else in the government we could spend, but we are giving it to you to go to do the PhD and come back and stay in your country and able to support that country. And if we have brain drain and we don't do mission, we will have our critical mass being lost. So we have, even with the brain drain, we have to continue doing it. But we have to do it in a very nice, less complicated, well-focused, as well as in a most efficient way. 
So that's why we are saying that in the next phase for the mission, we will be sending people, giving them reintegration grant to make sure that when they come back, they will be able to uh, uh, stay in the country in a good environment and to be able to be productive. That's the most important thing. Otherwise, you are spending, we spend on each individual almost one million over at the period of his stay in the, uh, between one and one and a half million over the period of four years. So this is something I believe is, has been done since Muhammad Ali, as you, some of you have mentioned. And it has been very critical. It has been very helpful. It has been, that's how Egypt maintained its strategic position in the region, being able to export some of the brain to the Arab countries. Michael, can I just give another figure? Uh, because we were talking about you know, the Chinese program. The Brazilian government has just decided to send 30,000 every year uh, to all countries in the world. And I how think. much money do you put as well? A lot. And I a think this is, I mean, research is international. And uh, I truly believe that uh, if you want to have successful research, then you have uh, to have international collaboration. Yeah, no and, and, this, and this is why we, we, last year, we created a new envelope for the Erasmus Mundus program for the Arab uh, countries of 50 million euros for the same in the same objective, to increase the mobility. And I, and I would like to, to say one thing here, that a few years back, we would have never have influence over Europe and what they are doing. They launched the program FP5, FP6, whatever, and we have nothing to do with that. We go there, as you rightly said, a consortium is formulated, and then they might need one more country. So they contact Professor So, he add his name, he takes peanut of money, and he has no influence whatsoever going on. Now, the situation is different. We are with the policymakers in Europe, setting together, setting priorities for the region, setting priorities for Egypt, and they take it into account, as Georgiou was saying now, in the last April meeting in, in Barcelona, they are talking about how we are going to do something for the Mediterranean with the participation of the South, with co-ownership, with funding from the South. This shows how we are committed to doing this, and we look for our partners to be working with us. And that's one of the main reasons why we are doing the Year of Science with the EU, with 27 countries. We don't want only to work with France and Germany and Greece because they are around the pool here. No, we want to work with Finland, with Norway, with Sweden, with everybody, because they are part of Europe and they are part of the advanced world as well. I'll just uh, add uh, very few things about uh, the cooperation with uh, Africa and uh, its relation with uh, the Mediterranean. Uh, yeah, in the near future, I mean starting from next year, there will be uh, a contribution of uh, the Egyptian government to the uh, Air Africa, which is uh, a program uh, designed in order to incorporate African and European, uh, African I mean from Sub-Sahara and from the Mediterranean uh, Arab countries uh, in order to fund uh, sci science and research projects. Uh, the same applies to what is called the uh, Mistrals, which is uh, another program, uh, again multilateral program, uh, between the uh, Mediterranean uh, countries. So yeah, we are trying also not to be, uh, as uh, Professor uh, Abdul Hamid said, uh, just uh, Egyptians, we are Egyptians, we are uh, Africans, we are uh, Arab, we are uh, Mediterranean, so we are uh, trying to uh, work on uh, all these uh, areas. Uh, the other uh, thing is that uh, our young uh, colleagues, they believe that there is nothing uh, available for them and so on, but I think uh, Dr. Hams, he mentioned some of the uh, possibilities that they can apply to. And in addition, at the moment, uh, the SDDF uh, has what is called the Research Support Grant, which is a relatively small uh, grant of 100,000 uh, Egyptian pounds. And this uh, can support some of the work of even the uh, undergraduates if their professors and supervisors apply to that. Uh, considering the renewable uh, grants, uh, yeah, it is always possible by the end of the first uh, successful grant to apply for a kind of a new extension to this work, and I, I think we discussed that. 
the final thing that I'd like, actually it's not the final, the, pre, uh, the one before last. Uh, I'd just like to uh, mention that uh, at the moment uh, SCDF is uh, planning to uh, launch some kind of uh, training programs for writing uh, the research proposals and even for reviewing the research proposals and the uh, and monitoring the progress of uh, the different uh, research pro uh, projects. Uh, the final thing is uh, Arabic, and I, I need to comment on that. Yani we all love our uh, language, and we are very proud of our language, but we need to use it whenever it is important to use it. We should use it between ourselves properly, not to talk uh, partly in Arabic and partly in English between us, and then when we are with people who do not understand this language, we should stick to the international languages. Now, I will speak in Greek now, so... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Could you also address the, 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 the FP8? Yes, yes, yes. FP8 yes, yes. Yes, yes. We will not have a framework program aid but we change the name. This is the reason. <laughs> we, we now call it Horizon 2020. And within Horizon 2020, you will have certainly the framework program aid, but we will not call it framework program aid. You will have the European Union, the European Institute of Technology, which is based in Budapest. And you will have the C program, competitiveness uh, program of the European Union. This will be a huge, Again, a big program. The whole envelope will be, is proposed to be 80 billion euros. And there are many, many, many new ideas in this program. In particular, the collaborative projects will be only one of the aspects. There will be a strong emphasis to non-collaborative projects to projects we give to brilliant and excellent researchers to create a lab, to create a team to do their research. There will be other instruments to boost innovation, such as uh, pre, uh, innovation procurement and the prizes, etc. It will be a really new program and what is also very important for me at least and certainly for you, we hope to succeed to simplify <coughs> a little process. bit the process, the procedures. Our commissioner took already the commitment that <coughs> the time to grant will be reduced by 100 days. Actually, it is 350 days, one year almost, which is too long, and it will be reduced by 100 days at least. So even European have bureaucracy. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, so this is the proposal. It is now under discussion in the Parliament, in the Council, between the ministers, uh, all the, etc., the long, long, long democratic process. And uh, hopefully we will see the new program on the 1st of January 2014. I would like to, to add one thing also that um, maybe related to the size of the fund, 18 billion. Even though the size of fund we, which you consider is not so big like the US. No, no, I think it's big. Okay. It's NSF, NIH, European, the Horizon 2020, and many other funders are putting together what's called the Global Research Council. And they are meeting in May, and we are lucky that Egypt is one of these uh, not funders, but attending and facilitating this process because we, this is how the globalization of funding is going to be and how to harmonize the process, simplify it, and make sure that we don't repeat the things we are doing. Not every partner does the same thing. We have to, because there's a lot of needs, and some of the needs are not addressed yet. And even though there's a lot of money, so we need to coordinate the effort in a way. So I'm just saying that there is also a global <coughs> initiative going on that is going to have the size of the fund that everybody has. So we, we have come to the end of the session. And uh, I would like just to uh, uh, address very quickly uh, uh, the comments. about Mohammed Yahya mentioned the comment of writing uh, applications. 
it is it is of course a problem until very recently until 2007 the egyptian research funds were uh, dispensed without any competitive process so this meant that we had this lack of this competitive culture so we had the lack of an, an incentive or a motive to write an application to get a research grant from 2007 this has changed and every single research fund that is dispensed through the Ministry of Scientific Research, the Science Technology Development Fund, the RDI, or any other funding instrument, the Academy of Scientific Research and Technology, all of them are dispensed through a competitive process now. So there is a learning process. Of course, you cannot compare the, the ability to write uh, research uh, proposals for a country that has not been doing it until five years ago to countries who have been doing it for 50 years. So we are doing it. We, we, we do uh, several uh, research uh, <coughs> writing, uh, application writing uh, uh, workshops. The STDF does it. The DAD actually does it, and we did, we do with them sometimes, the RDI and DAD did, did it together uh, a couple of years ago. So we are doing it. But <coughs> having said this, I don't think that this is the, 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 the obstacle of not getting enough FP7 proposals. For a simple reason, it is usually the coordinator of the project who writes the research grant. It doesn't mean that we're not, we don't aspire to be coordinators, but until now, due to the different non-compliant, sometimes, uh, administrative rules, we usually don't be the coordinator. But we are encouraging Egyptian research uh, uh, institutes to write proposals, and when they write, actually, the, the, the skeleton of a proposal, they will have more ownership for this proposal, and we're trying to help them and through also, again, I would like to remind you, you have a focal point in Alexandria University for the RDI program, who is Dr. Khaled Saadani and his team. Another important issue, in this last call of FP7, so this is the last chance of FP7, there uh, are several interesting, and I would like George to uh, excuse me for, uh, because I'm not, usually we're not allowed to, uh, to say, uh, 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 draft proposals will not spot. usually... Uh, I'm not allowed to speak on this. <laughs> yeah, I know. It's not allowed, but since I'm not, I don't work for the EU, well, actually I get paid by the EU, but anyway... <laughs> not uh, <laughs> anymore. <laughs> it seems so. It'll be my last words. Huh? Uh, there are interesting calls. Please look out for them. The, the call will be launched on the uh, 9th of July. Again, George doesn't yeah, know this. Yeah. Uh, and there are energy calls. For, for whoever was speaking, energy calls. There, there's calls for the Mediterranean on energy. And there is something called research to innovation call. I don't know if you were familiar with the ERA Wide. The ERA Wide, Dr. Suzanne Khalif here is, co is coordinating an ERA Wide project we, where we were, uh, she is the coordinator actually. There is like kind of phase two of ERA Wide. This is to increase this, the, to, to uh, increase the ability of the, our research centers. So this is capacity building also to use the research results in, in, of, in innovation, so close the cycle of innovation. These are very important calls that are going to be announced in July of this year. The, the drafts have been on the EC website for a month. Okay, you see, George, so... What, what? We're not... It says draft, but they usually don't change. Yeah, them. yeah. We'll talk, of course, about, about draft proposals, but the EC, they have this uh, long tradition of not EC uh, functionnaire. They don't like to talk about the proposals when they are still in the draft phase. But of course, we all know that they, we talk about them in closed rooms. So, uh, Khaled, do you want to say something quickly? Uh, regarding to how, how to write a proposal, we organize how to write a proposal session on uh, 10th of May on Faculty of Science and Shopping. Very good. Can I, can I say a, a word about, uh, uh, about how to manage science. Before to come to Egypt, I spent five years in China. So I know quite well the, the research system there. Of course, when we see the publications, we see that China is doing a lot of progress. Now, if you see more carefully how they manage the, the, the research budget they have, I think uh, there is still a lot a long road to go. Eh? You only have one single funding agency in China who makes proposals, open proposals, evaluations, etc. Only one on basic research. 
all the rest, you have the national champions, the national labs who are the champions in one particular area, etc., and the money goes directly to them without any competition. So I think there is how to spend the money is a very long process. Of course, they try to, <coughs> to change, the, for sure, but it will take time. Thank you, George. Again, uh, uh, I would like to very strongly, again, highlight what uh, Dr. Shibini said about human development. This is our core business. We're developing humans, so we definitely need to work more on, on sending people abroad. International cooperation and the culture of science is a borderless, you know, science and knowledge is a borderless commodity. It cannot be confined in one place. This is the one commodity that when shared grows. So we cannot really not send people abroad, but we have to put guarantees, not guarantees, but in, in, in intrinsic uh, in our system, we have to put warranty that they would come. Even if they don't come, it's better than not to send them abroad. But we hope that they will come. We hope that those young people here, when they uh, uh, go on a mission, Buasta Taban, will come back. Uh, finally, I would like to uh, very much, this has been a very interesting uh, session. I hope we had more time. We're already 10 minutes uh, beyond the time allocated to the session. So I would very much like to uh, thank our panelists today.